quite an update. Uh, there's been a lot of back and forth in the media, a lot of confusion. I want to give an update as to what's, what's been approved by City Council, uh, what Metrolink, the Provincial Transit Agency, has approved, and a little bit about um, LRT uh, around the world. There's been uh, a lot of back and forth in the media about what exactly we're talking about, and I just wanted to, uh, to, provide, uh, to provide an update. Um, just before I start, out of curiosity, um, how many people here ride the Shepherd 85 regularly? So, a few, but not, not too many. Okay. And how many people um, actually live um, east of Kenny? How many people live east of Kenny? Okay, so I will also... Okay, so some. Um, at the end of the presentation, I'll also uh, briefly talk about, about the Scarborough Rapid Transit and the plan for the extension and complete replacement of, of that. I saw some heads shaking and I sympathize very much with the server for having to, to ride them well. Uh, overdue uh, replacement for, for the for the um, So briefly, um, the, the congestion today, and for those of you that aren't too many here who ride the 85 regularly, by a very frustrating experience. Um, similar experience for, for riders on uh, Finch and Ryan, if you're uh, taking the Edmonton 32 or 34 bus, um, this is uh, you know, coffee time over at uh, at Big Park. And the problem is as the population grows, this is almost insufficient today. And within the next number of years, uh, a higher capacity service needs to be brought and provided to the residents of Scarborough. Um, big picture objectives of the overall transportation plan, uh, citywide coverage. We want to provide not just a line in one area, but a network so people can get all around, all around the city. Uh, improving access to employment, education opportunities, uh, making trips from A to B very easy wherever you live across the city. Um, making sure it's accessible right now uh, for seniors, people with disabilities. Trying to get on a crowded bus is an exceptionally difficult experience. Very limited uh, space for people with disabilities. Only one entry uh, at the front of our buses. Uh, the hope is with, with the new system to, to improve that accessibility by a great deal, providing multiple entrances um, with the light rail. Uh, and, and again, city building. This isn't just about uh, putting transit in one area. This is about a whole land use uh, development and a, and a city uh, land use concept across uh, the, whole, the whole of the city. So city planning will be starting soon uh, on Eglinton, um, talking about uh, land use planning vision for Eglinton. And uh, on Shepherd, uh, it is an avenue in the official plan. And what does that mean? It means there is a big picture vision for mid-rise uh, type development in conjunction uh, with high water transit. Um, the funding commitment, who actually is funding this? So in terms of the capital cost to build, there is not a cent coming from the city of Toronto. So yes, we're all taxpayers, it's all of our money going to it, but the budget is from the province. So the province has committed 8.4 billion through Metrolinx, which is their, uh, their provincial transit agency for the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. Um, at the end of the transit expansion, um, the province will actually, they will control the scope, the budget, the schedule, they will actually own these transit lines. So you may have seen uh, some news in the paper recently about who's actually going to be um, building the crosstown, will it be TTC, will it be the province of Metrolinx is the final authority for approving all of the design, as well as for Shepard. Um, so currently, uh, we are busy at work. If any of you uh, have been out to the Eglinton and Black Creek area, uh, we are building a giant overground tunneling machines will be coming soon, and we are building an underground at Eglinton because the street is actually too narrow to accommodate four lanes of traffic. Um, even if you wanted to build a surface, it would not make sense in that area. Um, and we are also busy, as you have seen, just outside over between uh, Kennedy uh, Midland area. We are building an underpass, which I will get to very soon. So finally, the GO trains uh, will be able to go under the street, and if you're driving, you will not be impacted by trains crossing the street. So improving the GO service as well as your driving experience. So what was actually approved by City Council recently, and what was approved um, by Metrolinx on April 25? So there are a number of lines. First off, uh, starting in the northwest of the city, this dotted line here is showing where the current Spadina subway will be extended north. This right here is a future station at uh, Keel Street. There's a lot of construction in the middle of the street. It is it's dug up up there for those who may, you may have read some news that somehow underground construction is not disruptive. I can very well assure you that it is immensely disruptive. Um, and there is a lot of construction going on uh, right here. Eventually, the, the Fitch line will go out to, uh, to Upper College, and that's, uh, that's a light rail transit street surface. Edmonton, I was talking about, uh, going as far west as Jane. And underground, uh, the ridership is predicted.
stretches to be much higher, but it's only underground because the street is only 26 meters in that section of that mountain. And much of Finch and on Shepherd's 36 meter right of way, and actually once you get into the Scarborough section, uh, one of the reasons why City Council and uh, Metrolinx have, um, have, have claimed to put this back in surface is because you can actually maintain a minimum of four lanes of traffic as well as the surface LRT and take the $2 billion that you can have um, from putting this back in surface and invest it to provide a higher order of transit to people both in North Etobicoke as well as all the way across Shepherd. The other big part, of course, and I saw head shaking when I even mentioned the rotten words of SRT, is the long overdue upgrade and replacement. So there's a common misconception that the Scarborough Rapid Transit is light rail transit. It's a different type of technology. It's actually powered by a third rail. It's very susceptible to winter weather. And LRT is much more reliable. I'll get to talk about some cities that actually, very cold weather cities that use uh, LRT. So this will, the technology will all be converted and it will all run in a dedicated right of way as it, as it does today with no interference from the population. And one of the keys actually with the, the change in plans um, is that we'll be able to actually provide the network connectivity by extending the Scrubber Rapid Transit. This is Progress Avenue right here near the Chinese Cultural Center and providing a new connection to the extended Shepherd East. Uh, so this right here is showing where the uh, plan stops are. There is an underground section. There is no plan to go at surface. There has never been a plan to go at surface from Don Mills to consumers. So in that very busy area at Green Highway 404, it is actually underground. Uh, it will pop back above ground, likely just to the uh, just to the west of consumers, and then it's in a dedicated lane uh, all the way across until uh, morning sun. We also have to build a maintenance and storage facility uh, out at uh, out at Conlins to store and actually maintain uh, the vehicles. So it's 12 foot kilometers, little underground section, and then it's uh, street level. By 2031, we're forecasting about 6,000 daily riders and about 19 million uh, for a year. And Metrolinx just announced that they were not planning to start construction until 2014 and to have this line in service in 2018. Now, Metrolinx made their announcement, they are like a TTC um, agency. The final decision still has to be made by the Premier and the province of Ontario. So, until the Premier and the province make that formal announcement, this is, uh, this is still uh, Yes, Metrolinx will own all the same thing. Is the same thing like the same thing? No. Uh, it will all be able to press the press the I just want to. If you're facing a question to the end, just make sure everybody gets a chance to make it. Okay. Yeah. 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 So just uh, just on the street, what you're well familiar with, I'm sure. Uh, this is showing uh, the great separation work that's underway. Once this is complete, uh, you'll be able to uh, to drive or uh, walk right under and across and uh, not have to have interference and much, providing much better uh, road transit service across. Uh, this is what it will uh, look like when it's uh, when it's all done. Uh, this is uh, this conceptual image looking east. This is the condo building that you may have seen on your way here, just on the south side, just over here, uh, north side. Um, and so in the future, uh, the, uh, there's actually enough room here to run tracks on either side of the bridge. Uh, and accommodate uh, the LRT to actually pass under this future. Uh, um, big picture, looking at why uh, why the TTC and Metrolinx recommend um, certain types of transportation for four different areas. Um, you know, TTC. There's nothing more exciting for uh, someone who's working in transit to build uh, to build a subway. Uh, TTC is, is very supportive of building both LRT and subways. What it comes down to is the land use and the projected demand. Um, over a long course of time to how many people are going to be riding. We don't want to build a type of service that's going to be empty for many, many decades because it costs a lot of money to, to operate empty trains. Now, there's, there's a good argument from those who, who are proposing. Some say, well, if you build it, they will come. So there's arguments on, uh, good arguments to be made on both sides. So if you build it, they will come. TDC service planning has a very uh, serious concern that they've expressed that if you were to build a subway where the densities aren't currently there and may not be for many, many decades into the future, you could actually wind up draining operating money for many, many years to be able to support uh, a system where the ridership doesn't come for a long time. So good arguments to be made for both, but that is the concern of TDC service planning. So looking, what are we looking at here? Um, this is the passengers per hour, and up here you're looking at the different, uh, different technologies. Uh, buses and mixed traffic can accommodate about up to 2,000 passengers per hour. 
Any more than that, and you're going to get you're going to get bunching. You're not going to be able to get on a bus. You're going to have to be waiting a long time to get on um, anywhere you go. And similar to the streetcars, it makes traffic. So if you've been down on, on College Street downtown or any of our streetcar routes downtown, you can really only accommodate up to about 2,000 people an hour. So once you start increasing that to about 5,000, you can put buses in a dedicated lane. That's it's it's more uh, it's more affordable than LRT. But the problem is. You can only get so many people on a bus. So once you get higher demand, even if you run so many buses, they start clutching up. And so you're not actually providing uh, the type of service that you need because people still can't get on can't get on the buses. Sorry. So after that level of okay. demand. A very good question in particular about this slide. Is that passenger per hour uh, average of the day? Peak direction. It's peak yeah. Peak hour. Peak hour peak yeah. direction. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then, if your projections are, uh, you know, well over 8,000, 10,000, all the way up to subways accommodating 30,000, then absolutely, um, it's fully grid separated. Subway is definitely the way to go. So this is just a general overview of the types of projections that our transit planners at TTC, as well as the folks at Metro, are looking at when they look at different corridors and decide what type of technology um, is is best and most cost effective uh, in the long term. To so just quickly, what, what, is, what is service LRT? What are we really looking at and discussing uh, for Shepard and Finch? Um, this is just a, an early concept uh, of what the vehicle will look like. It's a, a high capacity versus buses. You get many more people on it. And one of the key advantages versus the bus is that it's flexible. So as your demand increases, you can actually link two of these together to basically run like a, a surface multi-car train. As your demand increases more, then you can increase it to three trains. So you don't want to provide more service than there is demand for, or else you're just basically throwing away operating money. So it's flexible. It also has the ability to travel below ground and above ground. So if you have a narrow street, like on Eglinton, it's only 26 meters, you can only, if, basically you have to go underground or else the traffic uh, wouldn't be able to travel. You need to maintain those two lanes in both directions. So on Eglinton, in the short section, and for that matter, in the very busiest section under Highway 404, you can actually run these underground. Well, the question is, why not just do subway and bring subway to surface? Well, subway is powered by third rail, and if anyone touches it, they're gone, and then they're going to be buried 1600. So that's just the, the flexibility of it. Um, it happens to be about 60 to 70 percent um, less than uh, less than subway. So what does that mean? It means you can build uh, a wider network uh, for dollars. So certainly, if you are projecting higher demands, yes, you build subway. But if you're projecting demands that aren't quite as high, LRC allows you to build a network across the city. You can stretch your transit uh, reach a little bit wider than you can uh, with subway. So it's it's quiet. It's it's quite comfortable. Unlike the bus, like you're not feeling every bump in the road uh, when you're riding an LRT. And there's no local emissions on the street. This is electrically powered. And typically, with light like rail, similar to subway, will certainly increase uh, land values near the stations. The idea with LRT is that you have a more even mid-rise development across the corridor, and you're also uh, increasing uh, land values and attracting uh, some development. Um, there's closer access to stop, so buses are stopping uh, very closely together and not providing the highest speed. In LRT, it's really a middle ground between the, between the speed and, and close accessibility of your bus and your very high speed your wide stop spacing of the subway. It really is uh, the intermediate technology. So just a uh, quickly, very, very simple graphic. Um, yeah. What, uh, what kind of pickup shoes is that? Is that the, uh, yeah, it's, it's, an over, it's uh, overhead power. I'll get to that. Uh, uh, can you look at me? Uh, can you use a slider? Or yeah. is it a U? Slider. Slider. Can't it's right. can't hear. Yeah. Um, so just briefly showing, I mean, if, um, on opening day of, uh, of Shepard, uh, which we about, about 2018, Metro is projecting, uh, you may only have to one, run one uh, light rail vehicle, but you can certainly, um, you, you can put, uh, link it into two vehicles um, as a demand. So you get about 130 people very comfortably on one of these. Um, Bombardier, who was providing the vehicles, insists that you could fit 260. You would be crushed up against the window, and we're not publishing that number, but theoretically, yes. You could squish about 260 people on. We don't want to be doing that. And on a bus of about 50 people, yes, you can squish more people on, but we don't want to be going to provide a comfortable level of service. Um, this is just showing a potential uh, interior layout. Um, so there's certainly room, uh, room for scooters, room uh, designated space for wheelchairs. There'll be room for uh, for four uh, four designated spaces uh, for uh, mobility devices. 
Uh, just showing you a little bit of the low floor accessibility. So downtown, on the streetcar, is a huge problem, but a lot of the time that's, uh, that's really wasted is getting on the vehicle. It's a very long lineup. You can only get on at one entry, similar to the bus, and you're having to, to go up steps when you're downtown. With these new light rail vehicles, um, you have a, a platform that's at, at, at intersections, at stoplights, and you can actually just go right on. You know, this is, makes it accessible for parents with strollers. You can't even get on a streetcar today. Um, it's very difficult to get on a bus for that matter. And with these, you'll be able to just get right on from a, from a level platform. So one of the, the big uh, advantages uh, versus bus or streetcar is the low floor access. Um, this is just zooming out and showing what a, at, a, at an intersection what typically you could look at. So this is uh, the latest stop. Uh, this right here is the left turn lane. And across Shepherd and across all of these lines of surface, you're going to have a minimum, an absolute minimum of two through lanes at all times that are maintained in both directions. So four traffic lanes, and at uh, signalized lights, you're always going to have this uh, this dedicated uh, this dedicated left turn. Lane. So what do you have? You stop and potentially light lanes. So you stop, you uh, you walk across, or if you have a mobility device, you go across like you would at any signalized light. This is wheelchair accessible right here. And you don't have to get in the front like you would on a bus or a streetcar. There's actually four entries on every vehicle. So on day one, you might only have, uh, have one vehicle running, but as the demand grows, you could actually link it to two. And well down the road, you could actually link to three. So you're not throwing money away running more service than you need if you, you're meeting your demand. And certainly when the demand warrants, you want to be upgraded uh, long term and uh, have a subway in quarters that, uh, that demand uh, that capacity. So, uh, you have barriers here, so you're preventing jaywalking and people running across the street, and you're only crossing at, uh, at the signalized stops. Um, so this just doing out again, so you have, you have your, overhead, uh, your overhead power, and just showing a different view where you have your two through lanes of traffic, your left turn lane, and this is a far side of the intersection showing those two lanes going through, and if the city wishes, they can certainly have the room to install cycling lanes where there's more. Um, this isn't new to, you know, there are many cities, over 150 cities around the world who have implemented or are implementing um, uh, LRT, warm weather cities, uh, cold weather cities. Uh, just some uh, examples uh, here in Paris, France, showing two lanes, uh, two lanes both ways. would be similar. Uh, we're not planning to have grass here uh, up north, but similar uh, in terms of the traffic configuration to having uh, two through lanes uh, in all areas. In, uh, in Barcelona, just showing a wheelchair accessible uh, ramp, so it's a signalized intersection, you cross and just get right onto the vehicle. Uh, Budapest, Hungary, this is a very wide right of way where they can actually accommodate two lanes as well as on the street instead of parking. Um, fortunately for, uh, for Shepard and, and Finch, it's all off street parking, so there's not an issue to deal with. Uh, example from Germany, the little floor access. And one of the most common questions we receive is because, because of the confusion with the SRT and how unreliable an SRT can be, is what about LRT? How is this? Is it going to be reliable in the winter? The answer is yes. Minneapolis, uh, debatably, uh, not debatably, colder, colder weather city than here. They've done a uh, major expansion already, and they're actually doing a much bigger expansion uh, right now in Minneapolis, which is talking to a number of the planners there. And so the, uh, the LRT, the overhead power, will actually be much more reliable. Uh, in cold and, and, in, and in the winter and in snow than uh, the Scarborough Rapid Transit uh, is today. I'm very happy to say that the Scarborough Rapid Transit will be completely rebuilt and replaced. So once again, in Minneapolis, these folks heading off to see a, a Twins game uh, downtown. Uh, Los Angeles, um, I know there was a video I believe playing at the, at the start, uh, just showing, um, showing some of the, uh, the surface LRT uh, that they have. Um, Phoenix has a design, they're carrying um, an opening day, I believe, Years ago, three years ago, they were also carrying about 40,000 passengers a day, so a very similar demand uh, to Shepard. They have a large, some part of the right of way is, is, is very separated, um, similar to how a short section on Shepard would be underneath Highway 404. Um, they're also um, in certain areas running two trains together uh, where it's warranted, and they also have many areas of their street right of ways where they have two lanes in both directions as well. So, this is showing, this is actually uh, modeled. Uh, as to what the surface platforms will look like across the, uh, the system in, in Toronto. So what are, what are the features? This right here, um, finally you will not have to just deposit a token in and wait painfully in a long line to, to get on these vehicles. And about service planning estimates that roughly 20% of the time, uh, travel time on buses and, and streetcars that matter downtown is just waiting in line. 
Um, I do ride streetcars and, and use the bus regularly. I took the 85 over here. It's, it's quite frustrating. Uh, with these, you'll be able to just have a, have a smart card. You'll be able to, to load it to uh, a home or your computer. For those who do not have internet access, uh, you can pay, uh, pay in cash or pay with a credit or smart card right on the platform itself. And you won't have to wait in the line. There's four doors, you'll just get right off. So it's similar to uh, the way you get on a subway where you, you, know, you, you get your fare beforehand and get right off. So it's a, it's a, big, a big travel time saving. Um, big difference between buses uh, and streetcars for that matter, the spacing is wide. So subway you'd be about a kilometer apart. If you live by a station, that's fantastic. Um, if you don't live by a station, that's going to be uh, quite a bit of a trek. LRT is really a middle ground. So if a bus stops every roughly 200 odd meters on Shepherd, this will be moving it up to roughly, bus stops on Shepherd, but every 280 or so. Uh, it'll be moving it up to about every 450. So I mean, one of the obvious reasons why subway is faster, any type of technology stops further apart. It's going to be a lot faster. So this is trying to provide a middle ground between that accessibility and speed, your automated fare vending, um, and providing much more predictable travel time. So sometimes on a bus right now, on the 85, you might get a, a very fast trip across the evening hours. Um, on my way over here, I must have seen about 685 buses stuck in traffic, a common occurrence for most people riding into dog mills. It's painful to look at it, not only those 85 buses stuck in that traffic, but as well as the Scarborough rocket coming from the town center. So if many of you are traveling between the town center and Don Mills, I sympathize with you. Uh, it's very frustrating, particularly once you get around the big park area. Uh, it's, uh, it's rather horrific. So this will solve that problem largely by uh, stops a little bit further apart, quicker boarding, and then once you get to consumers, popping underground to avoid uh, all traffic places that really busy area. Um, this is just giving an example uh, today, looking, uh, looking at uh, the Morningside uh, intersection, um, the little school bus there, and the bus shelter, and just giving an example of, uh, of what it could look like um, in about 2018 or so with sidewalks and bike lanes if that's the, the way the city wants to go. Um, further east, there's a lot of room where you can widen Shepherd without actually having to purchase private property. So you have those very wide uh, right of ways. So one of the ideas behind the whole LRT program was you really want to plan this at surface where the right of ways are exceptionally wide, so that you're always maintaining a minimum of those two through lanes, and, uh, and this is at a light, so you have that uh, that dedicated left lane uh, for first turn. Uh, obviously, traffic congestion one of the biggest concerns. There'll be questions uh, about that, and that was sort of one of the reasons why this type of system is not being uh, not being recommended for narrower streets because we really want to maintain that through traffic. And, um, and that's it. And I just wanted to briefly get to the SRT. Um, I saw a number, but I don't know if you probably use the SRT uh, regularly. Um, and this is just showing uh, in a close up um, how this sort of network fits together. So you have Eglinton at surface, um, it will go all the way to Kennedy Station. And the SRT will be completely rebuilt and extended up here. Uh, to a new station of progress by the Chinese Cultural Center. This dotted line up here, um, we have an approved study that will get us all the way to the Melbourne Town Center where folks are dying for better transit. Um, so we have the environmental approval. In the Metrolinx plan, there is not funding yet to build that Fort North. We would love to start building that Fort North to provide that network connectivity to folks in Melbourne. So that really is the next step. But the SRT will certainly be uh, completely rebuilt. And uh, the 2031 forecast is for uh, a huge of your ridership up to 100,000 uh, daily riders. So stay tuned for more news on SRT, and thank you for. Uh